G'day ladies and gentlemen, how are you all doing? Scott at E49 here with you once again for another installment in the How to Play Warhammer 40,000 series. Now in this series we have been talking about the different ways you can play the game with your friends, also how to go about constructing army lists and everything that's involved in that as well as covering the core mechanics of the game as well. Now this is the ninth video in the series and we're going to keep on going through the phases of the game and today we're going to be covering one that's got plenty of action to happen in it the shooting phase. Now the shooting phase is made up of a whole heap of different areas that we will be getting into but before we do so ladies and gentlemen if you do enjoy this content and you want to see more of it make sure to hit the subscription button down below make sure you turn on the bell so you get notified when I do release these kind of videos as well but without further ado let's jump in on it. Alrighty, so as I said, the shooting phase is comprised of so many different elements and each of these has also got advanced rules in them as well. So we'll cover the relevant advanced rules as we go through each of these sections. And these sections are selecting your targets, ranged weapon types and making attacks. So we're going to start off with selecting targets. Now, when you choose a unit in your army to shoot in the shooting phase, you must select an enemy unit for each ranged weapon the unit is going to use before resolving any attacks at all. So say you've got an intercessor squad with 10 bolt rifles and you've got two units you want to choose. You can put six in one, four in the other, and that's how you can allocate it, for example. Now, to target an enemy unit, it actually has to be within range of each model's ranged weapon. So say the bolt rifle again, 30 inch range, it has to be within that range to be able to be selected as a target, as well as also being able to be visible to each model that is firing that weapon. Now, however, you cannot make range attacks if you're within engagement range of enemy units, nor can you select an enemy unit that is within engagement range of any of your friendly units as well. So pretty much you can't shoot in close combat, but there are some things that allow you to do so that we'll cover a bit later on. Once you have selected the target of your shooting attacks, if you've selected more than one enemy unit for that unit's shooting attacks, all ranged attacks for that unit have to be resolved before moving on to another unit to do their shooting attack. So it means that that six shots has to be resolved against that squad from the intercessors and then the four shots have to be resolved, for example, as well. Now, in your unit, if you've got more than one ranged weapon type that is shooting, you must again also resolve all the attacks for the same weapon before moving on to the next weapon. So say I've got a tactical marine squad that's got a missile launcher, a plasma gun, uh, seven bolt guns and a bolt pistol and a sergeant that's out of range. So I've got to resolve all the bolt guns at the same time if they're into the same target or split them up if they're in multiple targets. Then I've got to resolve the plasma gun. Then I've got to resolve the missile launcher. And each of those weapons can have different targets as well. So you've got to go through the sequence of resolving all of those weapons in the order you choose to do so before moving on to that next unit. Now, there are two different advanced rules that do apply to selecting targets. And the first up is big guns never tire. So this is directly related to vehicles and monsters. So the, one, the units in the game that have the vehicle and monster keyword. Now, they are still able to shoot ranged weapons when they are in engagement range of enemy units, but suffer a minus one to hit to do so. They can also choose to target enemy units outside of engagement range. However, they can't resolve those attacks if they are still within engagement range of an enemy unit. So it means that your best bet is shooting up the units right in front of you first. And then if you manage to wipe them out, that's great. If not, then those shots that you allocated elsewhere are gonna be wasted. The second rule when it comes to selecting targets is the lookout sir rule, which directly relates to character keyword units. Now, what this does is if a character keyword model has got nine wounds or less, it cannot actually be targeted if it is within three inches of a monster or vehicle keyworded unit or within range of a unit of three or more models, unless it is actually the closest available target. So it means that if it is the closest one, you can still target it, but if it is not, you cannot shoot at those smaller characters that don't have more than nine, uh, more than 10 wounds. That's about it for selecting targets, a little bit there. Now we're gonna be jumping into the ranged weapon types. Now these are the five general weapon types across the game. However, there are some factions like Orcs, 
uh, for example, that will have their own specific ranged weapon types, and you have to reference those rules in your AWP codex, for example. But when you look at a ranged profile, you'll see the type there. And what it'll have, it'll say maybe assault, and it'll say two. Now, the number of shots the weapon fires is always the number that follows after the type. So say you're wanting to shoot a unit of five Death Watch veterans with five Storm Bolts in there. Storm Bolts is a rapid fire two. You're in rapid fire range, so that half range. With the rapid fire rules, you follow through and you resolve those amount of shots. And we'll get into what rapid fire does. But you look at that number after the rapid fire, which is the two shots. That's what they'll be doing. And you have to fire all of a single weapon shots at a single target. So you can't say with a rapid fire weapon that you're gonna put one shot in one unit, one shot in another unit from a single model. That model's shots have to go into one unit. They can't be split up individually like that. So the first weapon type is the assault weapon. Now these are weapons that are able to be fired even after the unit has actually advanced. So the models have made an advance roll, so they've moved their minimum and D6 extra inches on top of that. They can still fire assault weapons. However, the negative to that means they're gonna be at a minus one to hit roll when it comes to firing their assault weapons, which we'll get into a bit later on about how to go about making those attacks. The second is heavy weapons. So say an infantry model's carrying around a las cannon. If it does move with that LAS cannon, specifically infantry keywords, when they do move with heavy weapons, they will also suffer a minus one to hit if you've moved and fired. And of course, if you do advance, because it's not an assault weapon, you can't fire it. So be mindful of that when you're taking infantry with heavier weapons. But in the meantime, if you've got it on vehicles or monsters or other types of units that don't have the infantry keyword, you do not have to worry about that minus one to hit. The third one up is rapid fire. And this is pretty, pretty much a staple across a lot of armies where if you get within half range of an enemy unit that you're shooting, so say you're shooting a bolt rifle that's got a 30 inch range and then the rapid fire range is 15, you're within that unit that you're targeting is within that 15, you then get to double the number of weapon attacks. So the bolt rifle is rapid fire one, you'll be making two. If we go to attacks there, if we go to the death watch, Veterans with the Storm Bolts, for example, that are rapid fire two, and you're within 12 inches for them, they're gonna be firing four shots each. The fourth type is grenades. For each unit that has actually got grenades of some form, uh, you can only have one model use a grenade for each shooting phase. And the fifth is pistols. Now these weapons can't be fired at the same time as any other ranged weapon type. However, they can actually be fired by the wielder if you're still within engagement range of enemy units. Now, we did talk about how you can't target enemy units outside of engagement range or the alike. Generally, pistols are what you're gonna pull out when you're in engagement range of enemy units and you're trying to win that combat. Pistols can help add that additional damage in your turn to win that fight. There is an advanced rule when it comes to these weapon types and that is blast weapons. Now, it's a ranged weapon specific ability that can never be fired against a unit that's within engagement range. So say you've got a demolisher cannon, which is a blast weapon, you actually can't fire that against a unit with big guns never tire for if it's in engagement range. Blast weapons will generally generate a random number of hits against the target unit that it's choosing to shoot at. If the target unit actually has between six and 10 models, the weapon will always make a minimum of three shots, no matter what the random dice result is. If it rolls less than three, it will always be three. However, if it's shooting at a unit that has got 11 or more models, it always makes the maximum number of shots because it means that there's a larger area that the troops are in. So it means it's more likely to hit more guys. Now we're gonna be jumping into the meat and potatoes of this video, talking about making attacks. Now, making attacks directly relate to both ranged and melee attacks. So I won't go over this section again, as it will be the exact same information in the fight phase for making these kind of attacks. So we're gonna bundle it all together, talking about it here, as it's gonna be the exact same. So when making any attacks, whether they're ranged or melee, you need to first make a to hit roll. For ranged attacks, you make a roll for each attack that you get from the same weapon type from the unit, and then you roll that number of dice and you compare that dice 
to the unit's ballistic skill, which is BS on their profile. If the dice results are equal to or greater than that, it hits the target unit. If it doesn't, it fails to hit. And again, it is the exact same process when it comes to melee attacks, but instead of comparing the to hit roll against ballistic skill, you compare the to hit roll against weapon skill, which is denoted by the WS on their profile. If a weapon has an ability that allows it to automatically hit, then you do not need to make any to hit rolls with that weapon's attack whatsoever. It just automatically hits that unit. Now, any to hit rolls can never be modified higher than a plus one benefit or a minus one disadvantage. So, however, you can still calculate all the pluses and minuses that a unit is affected by to determine the actual final modification on the dice roll when making to hit rolls. So it means that if a unit's got a plus two to hit, but a minus one to hit, it means that it's still gonna get plus one to hit on its attacks and it can't go higher than that. However, an unmodified six always hits and an unmodified one always fails. So it means that whenever you roll sixes to hit, no matter what's going on, they're gonna hit when you roll ones before any modifiers, they're doing nothing. Now, once you've done your to hit rolls, you then proceed to making your to wound rolls. Now, when you determine the result you need for your to wound rolls, you compare the strength of the weapon that you're using against the target unit's toughness. So if the strength of the weapon is actually double or more than the toughness, you need twos to wound. Very likely that you're gonna do damage. If the strength is greater than the toughness, but not double, you need threes to wound. So again, it's still relatively likely, but not as much as if it was a lot stronger. If the strength is equal to the toughness, you need fours to wound. So that's the most comparative result because it is on average 50%. So 50% of your to wound rolls should be wounding. If the strength is less than the toughness of the target unit, you'll need fives to wound. This is to represent the, the weapons not being necessarily the right capability or the right type to deal with that kind of unit. And so it's going to be a lot tougher to take down with those weapons. And finally, if the strength is half or less than the toughness of the target unit, you're going to need sixes to wound. Now, in this case, we're going to follow the same rules for modifiers as well as for to, the, to hit rolls, so it means it can never be modified above a plus one or a minus one, and an unmodified six to wound will always wound, and an unmodified one to wound always fails to wound. Now, after you've successfully made your to wound rolls and you've done some damage to the target unit, your opponent has to allocate those wounds onto models within that unit to make armor saves against. Now, the model that your opponent may choose doesn't necessarily have to be in range of the attack itself or even be visible to the attacking unit. However, if there is a model in the unit that has already lost wounds from a previous attack that phase or earlier in the game, all the wound rolls actually have to be allocated to that model first because it's already taken damage. Now, once the wounds have been allocated to the models in that unit, you then make armor saves for the unit, which is denoted by the SV, so saves, on its profile and how it works when doing so, you modify the dice roll by the attacking weapon's armor penetration value, which is the AP value on its profile. If the dice result is equal to or greater than the armor save needed with that modification of the armor penetration uh, value, the save was successful. Now, unfortunately, any unmodified saving rolls of a one always fail, but you'll notice here, there is nothing about unmodified sixes. So it means that you can actually have times where you cannot make armor saves at all because the AP value is that strong that you need seven plus on your save, which is physically impossible on the dice. When you fail a saving throw, the model you are making the save for suffers a number of wounds equal to the damage result, which is the D value on the weapons profile of the attack. So it could be a one, a two, could be D3, could be D6. Now, because of this damage, if the model is reduced to zero wounds, then it is removed as a casualty and any excess damage that would have been inflicted by that attack is actually lost and has no effect. So say you're attacking a Death Watch bike with a LAS cannon from a Chaos Havoc, uh, Chaos Space Marine Havoc, 
uh, and you get through the wound, you do six damage, the Death Watch bike's only got three, you're gonna obliterate the bike and those other three wounds will just do nothing. They won't carry over, they're just lost. Now, when it comes to making attacks and doing this kind of damage for both in close combat and shooting, and this will also relate to psychic powers because we've got three different advanced rules we're gonna talk about, which is invulnerable saves, mortal wounds, and ignoring wounds. Now, invulnerable saves are an alternate type of save that you can choose to take instead of your armor save on the model's profile. However, the difference is, you're probably wondering, invulnerable saves are actually never affected by attacking weapon's armor penetration value. So say a model's got a two up armor save with a four up invulnerable save and say it's being attacked with a minus four AP weapon, that's gonna take it to a five or six plus, I can't really remember off the top of my head, math wise, but it's gonna be better to take that four up invulnerable save rather than pass the armor save. The next one is mortal wounds. So this is something we did touch on in the psychic phase video, which I'm gonna talk a bit about here now. Now, mortal wounds are attacks that no saving rolls can be made against, no matter what, because they just can't be stopped. Mortal wounds inflict one wound on a model in the targeted unit for each mortal wound that is caused by the attack. Now, if an attack would cause a mortal wound in addition to normal damage, the target unit will still suffer that mortal wound even if it makes a save against the normal attack. There are many times where some weapons will be on an unmodified six to wound, you'll do an additional mortal wound to that damage. If that normal damage is saved, it'll still go through. Now, mortal wounds, of course, as I've said, they ignore armor saves and vulnerable saves. They are very common with psychic powers, but they're also common in certain combat, close combat weapons and ranged weapons as well. Now, the last one, ignoring wounds, is where a model has a chance to ignore any wounds it suffers, including mortal wounds. So this is the only way that you can actually protect yourself against mortal wounds. So these rolls to ignore wounds specifically happen after you failed any saves and damage is determined for the unit, but you can only use one type of rule to attempt to ignore each wound a model suffers. So you can't stack multiple benefits of ignoring wounds. Now, once you've gone through with all of the units you're wanting to shoot with and done as much damage as you can to your opponents during the shooting phase, you then move on to the charge phase. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, I hope that you have enjoyed the breakdown of the basics of the shooting phase. I know there was a lot in terms of selecting targets, the ranged weapon types, and making attacks in general that's not just applicable to the shooting phase, but also the close combat phase, which we'll get into more in future videos. But I hope that I've been able to give you a nice, clear explanation of the shooting phase in a whole, what's involved with each of those elements as well. Now, if you do have any questions at all, feel free to ask down in the comments below. And if you haven't already, feel free to drop a like and a subscription on the channel as well, as we're so close to the hitting that 100 subscribers mark, which is really, Appreciate it. Now, if you don't want to ask in the comments here, feel free to drop by my Twitch channel where I stream on Tuesday and Friday nights and Saturday afternoons going forward as I'm no longer going to be streaming my Dungeons and Dragons game. Uh, but we will do a whole bunch of hobbying, live games and such, such too to specifically focus on Warhammer 40k content. And if you don't feel like dropping by there or you can't because of time zones, feel free to drop in the Discord down below where we've got over 110 members there now from all across the world where we'll be able to answer any questions that you may have pertinent to not just the shooting phase, but anything 40K or hobbying related. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching the video and I hope to catch you in the next one.